Yeah. Okay. Last, <clears throat> last Sunday, or the last Sunday we did this, Neil Carlson asked the question, what caused the spiritual schism in 930 BC? I've been using the internet a lot to write this book, and so I, when I get a question like that and don't know how to answer it, I put in the internet, uh, what caused the spiritual schism of 930 BC? And nothing comes up. It brings up the spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, schism of 10 something, which is when the, the church between the Greek Orthodox split with the Western church. So then I put in, uh, put in uh, something and it came up with concubines. And so I pursued, pursued that. And actually what the schism of 930 BC is, it's an issue between adultery concubines and, and uh, uh, what was the other one? I lost my thought. Well, anyway, uh, the, the, the split between the East and the, and the, the, the Jewish people felt that adultery was not permissible. And the people on the other side didn't want to do away with concubines because that allowed men to have, you know, more than one wife. And the Bible says you should have one wife and one God. So that's what caused the split. They don't talk very much about that. <laughs> okay, so now we'll go to this today. Need your help, Carl? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the next slide. Here, you will have to go like this. Um, you might be able to. Oh, that's not gonna work. Represent that with the play from what slide do you want it on? The first one, and then the next one is right behind it. But I don't want to go through all of this. 
I don't know where the slide that you want is. At the top. Oh, well, then you got to go through all that. you got to... There. Yeah. So then play from current slide. Yeah. And then we got to... We have to go on to the other page. Oh, there it is. Hold on. That's, that you works. Gotta, we have to put it up here. Because you have to go off this screen and click present up there. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Whenever I need help, I go to my grandchildren. Okay. Development of Western civilization. Cyrus the Great was an example of an empire builder. We've been talking about empire builders. And he founded the Persian Empire in 550 BC. He took the name from the Indo-European tribe who migrated to that an area then called Persis. He defeated nearby kingdoms including Media, Medina, Lydia, and Babylon. Cyrus the Great, after taking Babylon, proclaimed himself king of Babylon, king of Sumer, and Akkad, king of the four corners of the world. And there wasn't anybody there willing to challenge him in the other kingdoms. So they just settled in. And that became the Persian Empire. Now, the Persian Empire became the world's first superpower, stretching from Europe to the edge of India. It encompassed the areas of modern-day Iran, Egypt, Turkey, and parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. His empire was a patchwork of languages, traditions, and regions, religions. He presented himself as a liberator rather than a conqueror. War was fought for many reasons. In Syria's case, he wanted to rule the world so he, come to, so he could practice peace as a benevolent ruler. Cyrus the Great's leg legacy is the de Declaration of the First Charter of Human Rights known to mankind, which he issued after, the con conquered ba after he conquered Babylonia. A cylinder containing the charter was uh, discovered in 1878 during an excavation of ancient Babylon. I tried to, I needed Carl last night to, to, uh, to help me put this in as a, as a figure, but I couldn't do it. Okay, Cyrus the Great was uh, known for human, bringing human rights. In this charter, Cyrus promised to treat all the inhabitants of Babylon and other kingdoms he conquered with respect. He swore that he would allow the, all inhabitants of his empire to practice their own religion and social customs without persecution. persecution. Cyrus also promised to punish anyone who acted cruelly to the religious and social minorities in the, his kingdom. Cyrus had no thought of forcing conquered people into a single mold and had the wisdom to leave unchanged the institutions each, each kingdom he attached to his Persian crown. In 539 BCE, he allowed more than 40,000 Jews who had been exiled to Babylon to return to Jerusalem. This allowed Persian culture to benefit from the 
truly global exchange, strengthening their empire. Now, this step was in line with his policies to bring peace to mankind. A new wind was blowing from the east, carrying away the, the cries and humili humility of the defeated and the murdered victims, extinguishing the fire of sacks, cities, and liberating nations from slavery. Now, I put author's comment, I am impressed with a leader who has a vision to end war. <clears throat> Why is this significant? Because this laid the foundation for the war we are still fighting today in the Middle East. When the 40,000 Jews returned to their homeland and they found their inhabitants had been taken over by their non-Jewish neighbors, the Palestinians. This was the beginning of the dispersion of the Jewish population to other lands, and that's how the Jews spread all over the world. And that's how it all began. Darius the Great became the ruler of the Persian Empire in 522 BC. He organized the empire into provinces. He was known for his administration genius, his great building projects and his benevolence. Like Cyrus the Great toward the diverse people under his sovereignty. His policies and building projects helped fortify the vast empire and entrances trade throughout. So he, he kind of started the trade routes so that they could move things from, this is the beginning of the, the Silk Road, uh, which connected the Asian continent with the Western continent and the Middle East and between it. And that's why we're still fighting over this. He built the roads from Susa on the Persian Gulf to Sardis near the Aegean Sea. So he's, these are all roads within his empire that will connect to the Silk Road. He introduced a new uniform monetary system among the provinces to encourage trade. This is the beginning of capitalism. He mounted couriers traveling for 1,677 miles from Susa to Sarda in nine days. The journey took 90 days by f on foot. It would become the Persian Empire's link to the Silk Road that would connect the Western world with Asia. Darius also had a yearning to be an empire builder. He led military campaigns in Europe, Greece, and even in the Indus Valley, conquering lands and expanding his empire. Now, just a note of comment here. This, this, uh, uh, what, what you're seeing happening here is, again, the reinforcement of the Middle East that's going to connect Asia and, and Western Europe and ultimately the, the United States. So the Persian Empire attached, attached from the borders of the Indian, India down through Egypt and up to the northern border of Greece. India became kind of the division between East and West. And we're going to talk about the different religions that they had later on. Today we know this is the Middle East. Darius the Great Reign lasted 36 years from 522 to 486 BC. During this time, the Persian Empire reached its peak. The Persian Empire lasted about 200 years. And the scary thing about this is, you know, if you look at anything that followed after that, the British Empire, it lasts a little bit longer. But you can, you can make wrong decisions that end a great empire. Now, when we think of ancient Medit Mesopotamian Greece and Egypt, we think of polytheism. They worshiped seven, seven major gods and thousands of minor gods. 
each Mesopotamian or Egyptian city-state, whether Sumeria, Arcadia, Babylonia, or Assyria, or Egypt, had its own patron gods or goddesses. So here you have the most of the world kind of living in a polytheism, and then you have the, the Jews starting to try to develop monotheism. Well, it took centuries for this region of the world to come up with a brief uh, belief in one God in the teaching of Zarathustra, and it became Persian state religion. Remember, there's ruler rule in religion. So, so we see the development of the of polytheism versus monotheism. Well, it took centuries, well, 3,000 years ago, a powerful creed emerged in ancient Iran that was called Zarathustra. A powerful creed emerged in ancient Iran when it found Zarathustra in around 626 BC, uh, began uh, uh, emulating Judaism. So they started to move in Persia toward one, one God. Now, religion in Persia, monotheism and teachings about one good God, they call him Aramasta. An elusive figure in history, Zarathustra became, becomes clearly visible as the center of monotheism faith who influ whose influence on other major religions to come later in is undeniable. Common belief concepts and lessons are plain to see in the doctrines of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So ultimately, this Zarathustra, and they're still existing, but ultimately that split into Islam. Now, I'm going to call them Zara and Zoro. <laughs> um, Zara taught that knowledge concerning the judgment of man's souls, the reward of, and punishment, good and bad actions, and the eventual purification of the world. So, kind of like Christianity. Um, the father of the Persian king, Darius the Great, made Zara's religion become known as Zoroth, Zoroastrianism, the state religion of the sixth century BC. So it's Persia's uh, state religion. Zoro gained popularity in Persian empires and began to spread in earnest to a wider world in the sixth century BC. Zoro dominance persisted for centuries but became a rapid end after the Arabs conquered in the seventh century. Uh, Zoro, Zoro now has, the, has, has estimated 100 to 200,000 worshipers worldwide, and the practice today is a minority of religion in parts of Iran and India. Um, Neil, uh, when we took over the plant in India, um, the, not the Tatas, but the people who ran the, the plant and the, and the Tata Steel were, were uh, part of that religion. They were called Parsis. Parsis are the main followers now of Zoroastrianism and Hindri. According to Parsa tradition, a group of Iranians, Zoroastrians, emigrated from Persia to escape religious prosecution by the Muslim majority after the Arab conquest. So now we're talking about the creation of the Western of uh, Islam. The Parsis are, the, are an ethnic minority in India and Pars in Pakistan today. About 60,000 Parsis are in India and about 1,400 in Pars uh, Pakistan. That's the end for my voice and the end 